Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Field Notes. I'm Brad Puffer on the Medical Office Communications Team at Fresenius Medical Care North America and your host for this discussion today. Here we interview the experts, researchers, physicians, and caregivers who bring experience, compassion, and insight into the work we do every day. There is mounting evidence that COVID-19 not only damages the lungs, but also the kidneys, often resulting in emergency dialysis. A recent study by the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research suggests that more than a third of patients hospitalized for COVID-19 suffered kidney damage in New York City. The study published in Kidney International also suggests that patients with respiratory failure were more likely to develop acute kidney injury, with almost 15% of those patients requiring emergency dialysis. In response to this crisis, Fresenius Medical Care rushed dialysis machines and supplies into hospitals across the U.S. to meet this demand, along with dialysis nurses who traveled to support the hardest hit areas. Despite this major health issue, fewer than one in five Americans know that COVID-19 can cause renal damage, according to a survey conducted in June by the National Kidney Foundation. So we all have a lot to learn. That's why we want to dive deeper into this important issue today with one of our company's leading nephrologists. Dr. Ted Toffelmeyer is the Senior Director of Medical Affairs in Canada for Fresenius Medical Care North America. He has spent the last several months looking closely at all the research that is showing the impact of COVID-19 on the kidneys. Dr. Toffelmeyer, welcome to Field Notes. Thank you very much, Brad. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our chat. First, for anybody listening who may not be a nephrologist, what exactly is acute kidney injury and how is it different than what most people think about as kidney disease? That's an interesting question because it could take a couple of books to uh, to go over. But the short answer is that what most people hear about with of kidney disease, patients being on dialysis, et cetera, is what we call chronic kidney disease. It's kidney disease where the kidneys have suffered irreparable damage and permanently will not get better again. Acute kidney injury is is a completely different animal. And from a kidney perspective or from a physician perspective, we really hope to be able to detect acute kidney injury early on in its course because it's synonymous with could be improved, could be could recover almost totally. So somebody with acute kidney injury may be able to recover their injury and get back almost to normal kidney function. And and with that in mind, how, how quickly does it happen? It may happen within minutes or hours or possibly days, possibly up to a week. Uh, and if we can detect it in that period of time, hopefully we can treat it to prevent it from getting any worse. So instead of a disease that's taking time to develop and finally the kidneys are not functioning anymore, this could be something that happens suddenly. It could be an accident, for example, or it could be a disease like COVID-19. That's exactly it. It might be an accident where the kidney injury happens in a period of minutes, or it could be a drug or a poison or a disease process like this, which may cause acute kidney injury gradually over a period of days, uh, which hopefully we can detect and then allow recovery. So when it comes to COVID-19 then, what do we now know about how significantly this coronavirus is impacting the kidneys and how big a concern is this? Yeah, that's a tough question. And I got to say it's tough because we only have six months experience with this virus. A certain amount of what we know about this virus is based on what we knew about SARS and MERS from uh, 20, 10, 20 years ago. And certainly we've learned lots in the last six months about what uh, coronavirus can do with the kidneys. And I guess it's for that reason that much of the data that we can see in the literature or on the news uh, can be quite variable. It, it's only because we've only had six months of experience with it. The short answer is that coronavirus can certainly damage kidneys. It appears that it can damage kidneys possibly directly by the virus invading the kidney and uh, more often and more commonly um, just by the disease process in the body itself causing a major inflammatory process which then uh, causes basically collateral damage in the kidney which causes the acute kidney injury. So it sounds like there's possibly two things going on here. You're talking about uh, the disease causing multi-organ failure, which impacts the kidneys, but you also mentioned that the virus could be actually attacking the kidneys themselves. How would that happen? How does that work? That's certainly an area that nephrologists are particularly interested in, and we get down into the molecular levels. And at this point, we don't have firm evidence that the virus actually causes damage within the kidney, but we are certainly collecting 
pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that look like the picture is going to be put together in that direction. What happens is that the virus itself, like like other coronaviruses, have a spike on the outside of the virus, which is then recognized by some of the cells in our body. Uh, this spike protein is recognized by the protein in our body called ACE2, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme number two. And some of the cells in our body that have lots of that enzyme on the outside of it, lots of that protein on the outside of it, can be found in our nose or our throat, a little bit in our lungs, certainly in our brain and our nerves, and some in our kidney and some in our muscles. So when that virus finds a cell with this ACE2 on the outside of it, that virus spike and the cell uh, ACE2 then come together, and that allows the virus to then be sucked into or, or enveloped into the cell. Once that virus is inside the cell, for example, inside the kidney cell, that virus can then take over the metabolic machinery in that cell and, and develop, uh, create new viruses, new copies of itself, and then put those copies into the blood to make the infection worse. Obviously, when it does that, that cell can no longer function as it was designed to function. So one would think that if, if that's happening in the kidney, then some of the kidney cells, which are designed to get rid of poisons and toxins from our blood, concentrate urine, get rid of urine, that sort of thing, some of those cells may then not work as they were designed to function. If it's acute kidney injury, that we might be able to reverse that. Well, it sounds like we still have a lot to learn, but uh, it's really interesting to think about just how this virus is going after the kidneys potentially. My understanding is that a lot of nephrologists were surprised by just how much acute kidney injury was happening in New York City, for example. So are some people more susceptible to AKI resulting from COVID-19 than others? Why would there be such a dramatic difference in some areas of the world to others? Yeah, Brad, that's a hard question. Um, and the reason is because none of us expected a high degree of acute kidney injury from uh, COVID-19 because other coronaviruses that have infected humans uh, have had a relatively low impact on kidneys, even though they've had a similar you know, spike protein that, that has uh, resulted in the infection. Certainly part of the issue is the type of healthcare, uh, the healthcare systems. For example, Italy had a high degree of uh, kidney disease. And I think that largely that was uh, related to the fact that their healthcare system really was overrun. I'm not sure about the, the numbers in China, whether they were overrun or whether they uh, addressed the, the patients uh, very quickly. We certainly get into the genetics of the patients. And the reason why genetics uh, rises is because the ACE2 protein um, is, is on our X chromosome. So we each have a little bit of a, a different ACE2 protein. Females have two different ACE2 proteins in general, one from each of the X chromosomes. Males have one. And so one of the questions is, are males getting sicker, are males dying faster with COVID because they've got only one X chromosome, one type of ACE2 rather than the females? Certainly there's genetic differences with the ACE2 around the world. And, and we're certainly looking into whether the COVID-19 virus has better attachment to some of those ACE2s than others, but we don't have evidence to support that just yet. We're certainly looking into it uh, very carefully. Uh, the virus also is changing it's evolved since uh, it was first seen in December, um, so that it has a number of different mutations on it. And, and one of the thoughts now is that maybe this evolved newer virus is, uh, is more susceptible, more efficacious at causing damage within kidneys or within human cells. So come back to me in six months. We will probably have more information along this line as to whether there's genetic susceptibility, whether there's ethnic changes, whether there's differences across the nations. Well, for those people who end up in the hospital with COVID and then also progress to acute kidney injury, how are we treating those patients and what are the best options for patients? This goes back to the basics of medical care. So a physician, when they see a patient, Right. We'll certainly be keeping an eye on their kidneys, and certainly because we know uh, COVID-19 can affect kidneys, we, we certainly watch for any type of kidney abnormality, kidney damage, uh, deterioration in kidney function. And when we're looking for that, if we see some sort of deterioration, if we can see that there's acute kidney injury going on, 
then the very first thing that we do, regardless of, of the disease, is try to figure out what the cause of the acute kidney injury is in this specific patient, in this specific instance. And even in the patients with COVID-19, there are a variety of different reasons why they might have acute kidney injury. Some of the patients in New York were found to be quite dehydrated when they first came to the hospital. And so the dehydration could be a cause of the acute kidney injury. Some of the medications that we're taking, we're giving them, um, may cause some deterioration in kidney function. So the first job of the nephrologist at the bedside or the physician at the bedside is to identify what the cause or potential causes of the acute kidney injury is, and then remove those causes. So if the patient's dehydrated, give them some fluid, either intravenously or, or, or to drink. If it's a, a medication that they're taking, then take away that medication. If it's because of the inflammatory response to the disease itself, then the best option there is to treat the disease itself. Try to reduce the inflammation, try to control the disease. And when you put each of these different factors into place to try to treat the acute kidney injury, the hope is at the end that the kidneys will be damaged only slightly and will be able to recover after the disease process has taken its course. And for those who do develop kidney failure in which the kidneys are so injured that they're no longer able to even produce urine or their function is drastically reduced. My understanding is dialysis and a, a wide variety of different techniques have been used based on the demand in order to meet the needs of these patients, correct? You're quite right that there's a wide variety of different types of dialysis that is being given to these patients. And honestly, it's not because one is any better than the other. It's because our systems around the world are stretched so much that any type of dialysis will do the trick. In some places, nurses would prefer to use a dialysis machine that has a remote control on it so that the patient can be, you know, 15 or 20 feet away from the nurse. In other situations, because the, the space is tight, it would be nicer to have a small machine that is, is compact and, and you can take care of the patient like that. Those, for example, are the next stage machines that you were referring to having gone into New York City. In other cases, some patients find that they do better if the dialysis occurs over a prolonged period of time. And this prolonged period of time honestly depends on what equipment is available. Can the prolonged period of time be over 8 hours or 12 hours or 24 hours? And whichever machine you have available, you can do it over that sort of longer period of time. So once a patient has dialysis, I have to emphasize that in this situation or when dialysis is given for acute kidney injury, that does not mean that we've all of a sudden gone into chronic kidney injury with irreversible prognosis, but rather the purpose of giving dialysis to patients with acute kidney injury is to, to tide them over until a certain amount of their kidney function can recover. And the hope is that the kidneys will recover to a certain extent, hopefully to the point where they can come off of dialysis. Unfortunately, this isn't often the case with many types of acute kidney injury, but I've just learned of some recent uh, data out of the United States where a number of these patients are improving after they've been discharged from hospital on dialysis, after they've been on dialysis for a period of time. Some of them, the kidneys have recovered even after that period of time so that they have been able to stop dialysis at least temporarily. Well, that's great news. It's certainly great to hear. There may be some people listening who are concerned about the long-term impact of COVID-19 on the kidneys, even if there is not acute kidney injury. I know there's a lot of speculation here, but is there any concerns about lingering or long-term damage that might have even not be seen right now, or is it just too early to know? Oh, it's way too early to know. Um, what, what you're asking really is, and, and this applies not only to the kidneys, but to the brain, to the nerves, uh, to the heart, to the muscles, What's the long-term effect of, of COVID-19 infection on a patient? How will they work? How will their bodies work physiologically after a year or two after the disease? And, you know, we have to wait a year or two to be actually able to see that. But certainly initial uh, suggestions, hypotheses, are that these organs may have suffered a certain amount of permanent damage, even though the patients have recovered kidney function after coming off of dialysis. There may well be some permanent damage there, but we would need to be able to follow them for a period of months or years to be able to see the outcome of that, whether or not there can be complete recovery or not. Well, Dr. Tolfomayor, as I mentioned earlier, you're based in Canada, still part of Fresenius Medical Care North America, uh, and certain regions of the world have been responding differently depending on the healthcare systems. But what has your uh, experience been in trying to address this crisis in Canada, and has it helped being part of 
the Fresenius medical care ecosystem uh, that is really global. Certainly from the perspective of a scientist or, or a clinician, we don't have a border in mind. We don't have politics in mind. We, we look at our colleagues around the world and try to see what they did best. And they always get in touch with us and direct us as to the best potential that we can provide, the best care that we can provide. I've been impressed with uh, the Fresenius Medical Care Global Office. Right from the first, there was wide open communication uh, around the regions. We had uh, calls on a weekly basis at first to, to speak with all of the leaders in, in each of the areas, uh, covering all of what their learnings were, all of what they were suggesting to avoid, all that sort of thing. It then came to um, devices. Certainly in Canada, uh, the preparation across Canada was to have uh, major centers get a good supply of ventilators, of Nova Lung for ECMO, uh, of dialysis machines, both acute and chronic, of water systems. Certainly within Fresenius, those requests were not uh, anticipated, you know, last year or the year before. So, so there was a lot of effort within Fresenius Canada to uh, see where we could fill those requests of our uh, colleagues in, in the uh, community. And it was nice to be part of the Fresenius family in that we could easily reach out to, to Europe, reach out to the United States, reach out to Asia, and quite frankly, reach out to our regulators uh, in the States, to FDA and in Canada, to Health Canada, to try to get uh, machines and devices that are available elsewhere into our centre, both Canada and the United States, so that they can be used. And, and that's happened in both of our countries. It has been impressive to see that response, and um, I'm glad you touched upon that because it certainly took a lot of coordination, collaboration, uh, and and work to get this um, to this point and to be able to respond the way the company has. The response goes further than than just clinical care at the bedside. The biggest help, the biggest armamentarium that we have as clinicians and scientists to treat this disease is information and knowledge. And one of the first things that the Global Medical Office put into place was one location where all of this, all of our information could be accessed and, and could be seen by everybody within the company. And, and that's yet another example of, of basically moving mountains to achieve something that was, uh, was beneficial at the bedside at the time. Well, that's a great point, Dr. Toffelmeyer. And uh, it's been um, really exciting to see that collaboration and work uh, in order to respond, not just in the U.S., but in Canada, where you are, and across the globe. It's been a complete pleasure speaking with you, Dr. Talfamiros. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's my pleasure, Brad. And to our audience, you can find Field Notes on the Apple Store or Google Play or right here at fncna.com, where you can also find our annual medical report and other feature articles. We hope you'll come back and join us as we discuss more important issues in the weeks ahead. Until next time, I'm Brad Puffer, and you've been listening to Field Notes by Fresenius Medical Care. Take care, everyone.